I feel enlightened by Falco's work here. And I, if I could roll the tape back, I wouldn't have been so forceful in saying we were lied to. And frankly, I've looked at it. I do some hedges. I say, if this thing is true, et cetera. But still, the takeaway from it is me saying, here we go again. It's more Trayvon, et cetera. But, you know, that's the way it goes. I left the window open, but we are not wrong to have called attention to that piece of work. What's necessary is to refute it. Hello, everybody. You have tuned in to The Glenn Show. I am Glenn Lowry. I am here with John McWhorter. We talk every other week about all manner of things, including race and politics and culture. John writes for the New York Times Magazine, and he's a professor at Columbia University. I am a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute and a professor at Brown University. The Manhattan Institute sponsors The Glenn Show. So John and Glenn are back. Welcome back, John. Thank you, Glenn. By the way, just a very quick, very minor correction, writing for the, for the Times rather than the magazine. I don't want people to be thinking some kind of change was made, that there was some kind of tension. Oh, know. did I say magazine? By accident, you did, but it'll start a Yeah, that was, a, that, that was an accident. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, well corrected. Um, so what's up, John? You want to talk about your most recent uh, piece in the Times in which you talk about uh, Rhapsody in Blue and Gershwin and uh, all of that? Yeah, it was um, a white musician, a white jazz musician, hip guy, youngish guy, wrote a piece saying that he doesn't like that Rhapsody in Blue is played so often, Gershwin's fusion of jazz and classical music, as you would have thought of that in 1924. He gets uncomfortable with all of this centennial celebration of it. And it's, it's a very interesting argument, and it's a very modern one, and it's one that I must admit irritated me. I tried not to sound too irritated in the piece. Can you repeat the argument before you refute it? I will. Because I didn't see it. His argument is that the Rhapsody in Blue should not be celebrated the way it is because it's not jazzy enough. So the way he puts it is that it doesn't swing. And that's true that the kind of dun, 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 that we associate with jazz, that didn't exist until the 30s. And Rhapsody in Blue is 1924, and it's more like Mickey Mouse dancing. That's jazz in 1924. So for him, he doesn't like the centrality of it because it doesn't swing. What he really means is it isn't hip enough. It doesn't jam. And he wishes that orchestras were playing something like by Duke Ellington, something that has the modern jazz beat, which he finds just groovier. And then he makes another argument, which is that he thinks that symphony orchestras need to learn about African and Latin and Afro-Latin beats and pay as much attention to that as they do to melody and harmony. So basically, here's a guy, white guy, who thinks that symphony orchestras need to hip up, that they need to be up there jamming. And what he means is that the jamming feel is the unquestionable advance. That the jamming feel is the essence of modernity, that Rhapsody in Blue with that Rudy Toot Toot kind of jazz, that's too primitive for us to be embracing now. And that even people who like their Bruckner and their Beethoven are really also supposed to be up there jamming because the jamming is as important as what the oboe is playing and the augmented chord, et cetera. And I found all of that. I mean, I'm glad he made the argument. I think he had a little bit of tongue in cheek, and it's not like he said Rhapsody isn't a great piece. But I found it immature. What he is is, you know, somebody with a pork pie hat on who likes jamming and likes black people. And, you know, he's, a, he's, he's ahead of the curve. And, and wait a minute, Glenn. And he, what he's basically showing is that he's hip to the groove and that therefore Rhapsody in Blue is wrong because it doesn't bust a move. And I just thought, no, <laughs> come on. So. Are you saying he's trying to be too black? There's a little that of that. He- in- incorrectly associates the wrong thing with blackness, the the swing, uh, the jamming. That's that's a kind of black, uh, almost native kind of uh, uh, authenticity that's uh, that is missing in uh, in uh, Gershwin. Well, those things are black. We don't have to pretend. That's you know, black people were crucial in starting it. But his point is that that also has to be done on the concert stage. That people need to be up there in tuxes doing that. That that is so important. Yeah, that that is black. And I think America jams in a way that it didn't 100 years ago. But he thinks that America needs to jam more, that the concert hall needs to open up, 
to the to to mingusness. And I think it's pretentious. He's you don't have to push it that hard to show that you like black people and you like black <laughs> mingusness. <humans>. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he's thinking. I'm not a musicologist. I'm not even close. You impress me with your uh, with your knowledge, but I do know a little something about Charles Mingus, and I love the I sound. I, I love that uh, cacophony, that kind of, and it is modern. It does feel very modern to me, and that messiness uh, and the swing. Yeah, you know, I mean, it is the the musical uh, correlate of a certain kind of uh, poetic voice, where you know, you you. Really, it, and there's an abstraction and, and, a, and a kind of uh, in, in intellectual uh, content to it. It's deeper than Rhapsody in Blue. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I get All why right. he likes it, but why does so he So race to... doesn't come in. Race doesn't come into this uh, critique. He doesn't say it, but you can fill it in. You know, he, he, wa- he wants their, the black voice to have its say, and therefore you need to black up the symphony hall. And my point is no... We're at the point where nobody thinks the symphony hall is the quintessence of what music is. Why can't you do Tchaikovsky in there and jazz can be done in different spaces? Nobody's thinking that music hasn't arrived until somebody stands and conducts it in a tuxedo. That's how people felt 100 years ago, but that's that's long gone. And you can talk about how jazz is dying. Well, so is classical music, and people have been saying that about both of them for 60 years. It's time for him to understand that maybe Duke Ellington does get his due. It's because people aren't playing it on stages where the where the ensemble is called Philharmonic. Doesn't mean that Ellington doesn't get his due. Ellington gets very much his due, just in different spaces. Wynton Marsalis is as good as the Philadelphia Orchestra. There's no there's no difference in quality or status. I think he's pushing it because he has a certain agenda. And I get the agenda, but no, that doesn't mean that you diss the Rhapsody in Blue. It's a wonderful piece. And why be so ahistorical? It's 100 years ago. Swing doesn't exist yet. Why say it needs to be buried because swing doesn't exist, as if we're talking about the difference between no penicillin and penicillin? It's just, I found it fake, put it that way. And I thought I would respond. All right. Well, glad to hear that report. What else is going (laughs) on in your world? Well, Glenn, we need to talk about the, um, this is very important, the George Floyd issue. Because... Our statements about George Floyd have stirred a lot of people to watch a certain documentary. And now there's been a response to the documentary. And we need to, what's the word smart people use? Um, We need to contextualize um, Radley Balco's journalistic sleuthing in response to the documentary. What do you think? Okay, let, let me try to set it up then. So the documentary is called The Fall of Minneapolis. Uh, J.C. Chase and uh oh Liz Collins Liz Collins uh Minneapolis conservative journalist filmmaking uh crew uh let's tell the police side of the story of what went down in the killing of George Floyd uh including the trial of Derek Chauvin the police officer who had his knee on Floyd's neck uh and uh it's an expose uh that uh alleges that uh, Chauvin was convicted on flimsy evidence and through a biased court and uh, process, uh, and that he, in effect, is in, wrongly imprisoned uh, in a federal prison in Arizona for uh, the murder of George Floyd, didn't kill George Floyd. Um, and there, as I recall in the film, two basic arguments to that effect. One of them has to do with the um, encounter between Chauvin and Floyd, in which Chauvin kneels on his back, shoulder slash neck. And whether or not Chauvin was uh, acting in a manner consistent with the police training and protocols for the restraint of suspects. Um, And the other is about the cause of death of uh, uh, George Floyd, uh, given that he had uh, substances in his system and he had a bad heart and all of that. And again, whether or not Chauvin's treatment of Floyd in that incident quote unquote, causes death, asphyxiation. Um, So the film depicts all of this in a manner to raise questions about the resolution of the conflict that the court came to. uh, And one could go into greater detail about this. Uh, You and I invited the filmmakers onto the show after we had discussed the film ourselves in a separate episode. That episode went viral. 
It got over a million and a half views and it drove a lot of traffic to the site where the film was being uh, uh, projected at uh, YouTube. Uh, and then we had the filmmakers on and we questioned them about uh, some of the uh, discrepancies. We in, indeed in, uh, had heard from uh, Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison about uh, this uh, film, about our depiction of the film. Which Ellison led both of us to have some serious questions. And he and 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 we, you know, did some due diligence and in looking into some of the things that and share with our audience what Ellison was saying, confronted the filmmakers with questions about it and so on. So uh, we were involved in the uh, discussion of the film and indeed put up posts with uh, thumbnails like we were lied to us words to that effect, uh, John, because they were your words in that particular instance that. Uh, the narrative that came out of the killing of Floyd and the reality of what actually happened up there were not the same. Okay. Coleman Hughes also has picked up the young Coleman Hughes podcaster, Coleman's Corner, uh, Conversations with Coleman, uh, also picked up on uh, an author of the book that just got released, The End of Race Politics. This is Coleman, uh, Coleman veteran of confronting ta Colts at a congressional hearing on reparations a few years ago, taking the con side of the reparations debate against a young Coleman Hughes, 27, 28 year old uh, graduate of Columbia University, your employer, John, uh, took this up and put up a big piece at Barry Weiss's uh, newsletter in which he uh, took up the uh, question of uh, whether or not George, uh, Derek Chauvin was rightly convicted of murder of George Floyd decided in the negative and made the case based on the film, largely, uh, that uh, that case was wrongly decided against Chauvin. And in reaction to Coleman, Radley Balco, uh, a, uh, God, now can I describe him properly? He's a veteran, a crime and policing reporter, uh, was with the Washington Post for a long time. Uh, Okay. You want to add to that, John? Um, I don't know that much about him, but he's an established name. He's a respected figure, um, by no means some sort of you know marginal partisan. And he has done a very begun a very detailed response to Coleman's piece, and and by extension us. But he's taking Coleman's piece as the demonstration case for his purposes. And so far, there's been one very lengthy um, post responding to the documentary, and he's promising. More for some reason in my head it's two more pieces, but maybe it's more than that. He's promised three pieces: one dealing with Chauvin's knee on uh, on uh, Floyd's neck, and the restraint, the maximum restraint technique controversy, which we'll say more about. Right. Another dealing with the toxicology issue, the uh, what caused his death, and uh, whether or not that was uh, properly handled uh, by the uh, judicial procedure, and then finally a summary piece in which he pulls all the pieces of the two okay. main arguments together and says, what does it all mean? Mm -hmm. uh, and we have seen the first, but not the second and the third of these pieces. So this is an issue that we may come back, which he has not yet posted. This is right. at the time of this recording. So this is an issue that we might come back to. Um, he is very hard on Coleman. He's, he's got a snide kind of dismissive tone. Coleman Hughes says he does his own research. Well, if he had done his own research, he would know the following. The following mainly being that the testimony of police uh, uh, leading police leadership at the trial of Derek Chauvin to the effect that Chauvin was not deploying the standard technique of maximal restraint that the police officers of Minneapolis are trained to deploy. They testified that Coleman, that Chauvin was not in compliance with the maximum restraint technique. And the film alleges that that was false, that that testimony was false. It, the film, in effect, accuses these persons of perjury because in the manual for police training, there's a photograph of a situation in which someone is kneeling on the back or shoulder or neck of the, uh, of the person being arrested in a manner very similar to that which Derek Chauvin was deploying with George Floyd. Um, 
And Balco alleges, or argues, I should say, that uh, they were not those who testified uh, that uh, Chauvin was out of line with police training, were not perjuring themselves. Rather, the documentary filmmakers were selectively reporting their testimony when accusing them of perjuring themselves, reporting only the part where they said the technique was not consistent with police training, and then showing us the manual where the apparent uh, depiction is similar to what uh, Chauvin was doing, but not including the the part about the um, hobble, the, the right. device that's supposed to be in front. This is the take. This is the takeaway, right? Uh, which is with the knee technique, the hobble device, rolling the uh, person on their side, making sure that they're not face down, and being alert to the possibility of asphyxia was a very important part of the whole police training process, and that's not represented in what's in the documentary film. And Coleman, apparently, according to Balco, misses this part as well, and therefore gives a false impression, a false and selective impression of exactly how Chauvin's behavior and police training did or did not comport with each other. And a little, a little bit more, the, the idea is that it's not... Um, of many people have leaned on the shoulder, which maybe extends into the neck of people. Chauvin has apparently done that many times and did exactly what he did with Floyd. Many people have used it, but the idea is to only use it quickly, like for, say, 30 seconds, as preparation to getting somebody into this hobble, which is a completely different thing and keeps them from being a harm to themselves because Floyd needed to be restrained. So you're supposed to do that in order to snap somebody into the hobble, not to just hold them there on the street for minutes and minutes and minutes at a time. That's that's what I took, especially from Balco. They did not say that in the documentary, and that is extremely misleading. And I would be interested to know what the documentary maker's response to that is. But yeah, so MRT is not unheard of, but Chauvin is not use, was not using it right, is, is the issue. Is that what you got out of it? Yeah, that's what I got out of it. Uh, but I, what I mainly got out of it is the filmmakers were dishonest in their depiction of the situation because they left the testimony of the police personnel who were mainly trying to say Chauvin was off the reservation. He, his behavior was not consistent with the appropriate procedure. Uh, it made it look as if they were saying uh, something different from what they, in the fullness of their full testimony, was saying. And what I took from that was a discrediting was two things discrediting the filmmakers, but also by indirectly discrediting people who took the filmmakers at face value, like me and you, and Coleman Hughes. You know, Glenn, I think on this that um, I, I think we were within our rights to call attention to the documentary. I think that it's one thing to look at all of this blow by blow. It's another thing to look at what a conversation is supposed to be. And conversations, national conversations are sometimes messy. For that documentary, as well made as it is just in the objective sense, to be out there and for good thinking, bien pensant people to simply ignore it because it was made by conservatives would not be the way conversations go. Somebody needed to call attention to it. And frankly, we were some of the only people who would do it and be able to make big enough a noise to get other people to look. Now, this is the problem. It may turn out to be that this one was made by conservatives who were not well-meaning or who were incompetent or came in with some sort of seamy bias. That may be the case, but that's not true of all conservatives. And I think that we needed to bring it in. And then if Balco comes and basically refutes what they're saying, he has done a service and we can move on. But for that documentary to sit there, gradually seen by more and more people with various people thinking, well, that's the way it really went, to simply not respond, I think is not, constructive. I feel enlightened by Balco's work here. And I, if I could roll the tape back, I wouldn't have been so forceful in saying we were lied to. And frankly, I've looked at it. I do some hedges. I say, if this thing is true, et cetera. But still, the takeaway from it is me saying, here we go again. It's more Trayvon, et cetera. But you know, that's the way it goes. I left the window open, but we are not wrong to have called attention to that piece of work. Uh, the, what's necessary is to refute it. 
And that's what. Well, no, the question is isn't. I don't think the question is should the film have been acknowledged and recognized. I think the question is how it's interpreted. And I think the question for us is, were we too credulous? Not that we should not have ignored it, but that we should have been more skeptical uh, about it, uh, uh, particularly about its technical claims, uh, which challenge the limits of our own uh, expertise in terms of being able to evaluate them. So we're trusting filmmakers to a certain degree uh, when we do that. All right, you may want to reply to that. Let me just say another thing before you do. Um, I've been asking myself the question, how could I have been so, uh, I almost want to say gullible? Uh, how could I have been so credulous? How could I have not had my guard up? Uh, and, I be, and, and I think the answer is, well, I wanted a counter narrative to the dominant narrative about what happened uh, to George Floyd and the subsequent developments of the summer of 2020. Um, I didn't like that police station being allowed to be burned to the ground. Uh, I thought that the lionization of Floyd, the heroic, the elevation of him to a heroic status to the point that the president, then a candidate of the United States, could say, I'm talking about Biden, in 2020 that Floyd's uh, death resonated. I'm not quoting him, but this was a, the effect. On a global scale, there were demonstrations all over the world, Black Lives Matter and all of that even more resonantly than did, uh, even more uh, profoundly than did the killing of Martin Luther King in 1968. I hope I don't misquote here, but I uh, definitely believe that uh, President Biden said, then candidate Biden said something to that effect. It was a big deal. It was a big fucking deal, the killing of George Floyd. The country seized up on something. And I, I wanted not to be... Uh, I, I, when the opportunity to question the narrative came along, I jumped at it and perhaps incautiously so. That's what I want to say, which raises a question in my mind more broadly. Being heterodox, being against the grain, anti-woke, uh, being the black guy who said the thing that black guys are not supposed to say, you can inhabit that persona to such an extent that your judgment is uh, undermined by it. Uh, and I, I take that as a as a warning. I mean. I'll accept what you say. No, uh, we didn't, you know, do anything wrong. Uh, but I'm still a little bit chastened by Radley Balco's, uh, you know, I mean, and, and what he does to Coleman, uh, people can read this and see for themselves. Coleman, the uh, youngish, uh, uh, upstart, uh, uh, conservative black intellectual, uh, is is really... Uh, uh, disquieting. I mean, he, you know, he says he's way out over his skis. He, he says, you know, uh, he's a propagandist in so many words. And Barry Weiss takes a hit indirectly uh, from uh, Balco. What kind of outfit is she running over there? Is she subject to the same temptations that we are to, as we inhabit this role of anti-wokeness, to too quickly embrace something that we ought to think twice about before we we jump. Glenn, kind of you're thing. you're harder on us than I would be, actually. Um, yeah. Frankly, the narrative about cop killings has been lies so often that I think I wasn't motivated by sitting in a heterodox groove and beginning to play the role. With all due humility, I I check myself for that as much as I can. However. You can't always be 100% sure. And given how strong the pattern is of the stories of that kind being lies, I think I was quite reasonable in thinking, oh, good Lord, here's another one of these cases. I wouldn't be surprised given the pattern. It isn't that I had some brief where I wanted to you know, disprove the story of George Floyd. It's that I thought, oh, no, because frankly, I had believed it like everybody else. But I was thinking, oh, no, is this going to be another one of these things where what we saw was not what we were told we were seeing was not what was actually going on. And I think what's important is this one. When Ellison wrote us with his, you know, polite scorn, you know, here's what really happened. Both of us went and looked at the whole report of that pulmonologist. Both of us watched it. I, I certainly yeah. watched the whole thing. And 
It worried us so much that we called those two people on. That's when we called them on. We asked them questions. By the end of it, we were not saying, ha, we were right. Or at least I certainly wasn't saying it or thinking it. There was kind of a big question mark by the end of it. We did, we did our job. And Glenn, remember, there's a kind of person, kind of people who sometimes would even think of themselves as being in our camp. Think about it. Where they would have gotten the email, the emails from Ellison with that tone of his. You can tell he hates us, but he's, he's trying to do a service. Them. And they would have dismissed it. They would have said, oh, fuck him. Now, forget it. They wouldn't have wanted to dig in and keep going. We both, frankly, I'm going to pat us on no. the back. We both had the presence of mind to think, even if this person hates us, we need to look into this more. We did our job. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to argue with you further. I did see Coleman on Bill Maher last night touting his new book. Have you read the book, The End of Race Politics? I have. Yes. Yeah. So what do you think? Um, good book. It's interesting, though. Um, and I say this, I, will, I would say it if Coleman were sitting next to me. I wish he wrote more about the cops, oddly enough. I, I, I wish that he wrote more about the role that that plays in the kind of exaggeration that he so rightly decries about racism. But generally, his book is, I mean, Coleman is absolutely brilliant. I think he's brilliant enough that in response to Balco, I think he's capable of saying, I made a mistake and move on. I think I, I, I would assume that that's what he's going to do if that's what's necessary. But no, the book is great. It's like um, if it were classical music, it would be Sibelius. It's just so clean and perfect and reasoned. And he must get so frustrated that that kind of reason just cuts no ice for so many people. But I thought he did a really... I thought he did a really nice job. Well, you and I are going to be out of work if, if they end race politics. We're the black guys, remember? <laughs> we're, we're, we are at least, uh, I don't know what percentage, 40%, 60% of the play here is about how we analyze this complex set of issues and the kind of unique insights that we bring to bear and, and the what we represent about race commentary. Uh, you know, we're not the people with three names. We're not Nicole Hannah Jones or Ibram X. Kendi or Khan Hasi Coates or whomever, Michael Eric Dyson. Uh, we're kind of at the opposite end of the spectrum of that. And that's a spectrum that exists uh, only because of the, of the racial issue. So the end of race politics is the end of our gig, man. You okay with that? Yes, because I make sure to have other things prepared. And to be honest, if I could only talk about linguistics and music, I would be perfectly happy. And more to the point, people are not going to stop talking about race and racism, and they're not going to stop exaggerating. I think if we're going to think of it that way, we're going to keep having stuff to talk about. But even if we didn't, that's technically what I'm going for. The only reason I got into this is because I started feeling the late 90s. Why do we have to exaggerate so much? Why do, It's not that there's no racism, but why is it that I'm expected as an enlightened person to so vastly exaggerate? And people are going to keep exaggerating. So here we are. Yeah. Well, about Coleman, I'm uh, optimistic uh, for his future and I'm uh, admiring of what he's accomplished. And he is a very talented young man. And I blurb the book. I you know, uh, do I detect I want, some kind of hesitation, Glenn? Well, there's going to be a comment. And uh, the comment has to do with the end of, you know, and uh, I, I guess, uh, is it Fukuyama, the end of history in the last man, that, that famous essay from way back interpreting what the international political implications of the defeat of the Soviet Union in the Cold War uh, where and so on. The end. I mean, is race something that we need to get away from color blindness and all of that? It, this evocation of Martin Luther King Jr., you know, 1963. I, I just watched uh, the uh, Obama executive produced uh, Netflix uh, film, uh, bio pick of Bayard Rustin. And uh, I, I, I thought it was very interesting. I don't want to get off track. Uh, we could talk about that if you and when you might look at it if you want to I didn't talk think about it was it. as good as we're supposed to think it was, but we can talk about it some other time. Yeah, some other time. End of race. And I think 
okay, so so there's some arguments about colorblindness. To have King reduced to uh, that, uh, you don't have to be Michael Eric Dyson to see the problem with that. I mean, or Cornell West to see the problem with that. The, the prophetic voice of King, colorblindness, uh, to have it come out as a, a procedural dictate that, you know, we're, we're not supposed to do affirmative action. We're not supposed to have racial preferences. Uh, so so I think that, I think it it kind of, projects down onto a very small space the racial the weight of the racial history of the country and it doesn't reckon with it in its fullness i and and i'm not sure exactly how to flesh that out but I, but i can try but that's that's one thing i think um well glenn how about i know what you mean i know where you're coming from although i was very moved by one page he had where he gave all of these very ordinary statements that, uh, frankly, the three name people make these days and saying that on race, whatever you think about King on diplomacy, Vietnam, whatever you think about King on um, poverty, um, Chicago, et cetera, he would not have agreed on race with an awful lot of things that have passed for wisdom since the 70s. And I think he was right. But yeah, he, he, Coleman didn't go on for 350 pages. And there is a limit to how much he's interested in plumbing the psychology of, of people, um, which is, you know, that, that's just his personal preference. But can't you take what he's saying as pointing to the future? Like maybe he thinks we shouldn't have been thinking about color in 1970, although I'm not sure he would say that. But it's the way we should be going, right? We can't change it tonight, but, you know? Yeah, well, uh, you know, I've argued that myself on more than one occasion, transracial humanism and all of that, and the critique of the heavy racial focus in the as we uh, educate these kids at the elite campuses where I want the kids to see themselves as privileged inhabitants of the 21st century uh, at the pinnacle of Western civilization with the be bequest of greatness uh, from uh, posterity which they have now the opportunity to acquaint themselves with. And I don't want them to live in these little silos. I want them to be, I want them to be broader than that. And, and I agree with that. I agree with all of that. Uh, and I've been a strong critic of affirmative action as, as well. Um, I once wrote a piece for the New York Times back in the uh, uh, early aughts when the uh, Michigan cases were coming to fruition. And a lot of people were talking about affirmative action. And I was against colorblindness as a normative principle in the piece. And I said, it, it is, it's a procedural restraint. It says, don't make the way you treat somebody conditional on their identity. But it's not a substantive moral position around the racial question, which would be more like, I'm indifferent to the racial composition of the prisons. I don't care about the differences in the poverty rates or the infant mortality rates or uh, the uh, uh, f mortality from COVID rates or whatever. I mean, race doesn't matter, not just at the level of a person being not defined by race, but at the level of a society being neutral or indifferent to the racial aspect of its own social ecology. You know, who lives in the ghettos, uh, who's in prison, I've said, uh, you know, et cetera. And I said, whereas the procedural restraint, blindness, don't you judge the kid's application for a program of study by this superficial trait, was uh, very compelling to me and to a lot of people. The substantive blindness uh, let history's long shadow of racial. Uh, hierarchy uh, continue on without it uh, moving, without being moved by it. Uh, that I thought was was less compelling morally, much less compelling. And I thought, moreover, that the people who try to bait and switch me, that is, get me to agree to the latter proposition, we should stop worrying about how many Black people are in prison because they're Black, by the former argument, it's a bait and switch, King wanted to be colorblind. A person's race doesn't matter. A person's race doesn't matter for whether or not I marry him or her. A person's race doesn't matter for whether or not we 
admit them to this program, and therefore I should be indifferent to the racial aspect of American social hierarchy. Uh, that that I, I feel that that's a that's that's a problematic move. Um, and I give one example to see what I say what I'm talking. So I have a city. The city is electing. Uh, representatives to the city council. And they could do it in one of two ways. They can do it in at-large elections across the city, or it can break up the city into residential districts and do it at the district level. Everybody running at-large means that the minority candidates are less likely to have a chance of getting elected. You break up the city into residential districts, every neighborhood having its own ethnic and racial coloration, uh, likely to have some voice in the government of the country. Now, whether or not to do that, is a question about, in a way, about blindness. Should I be indifferent to the racial consequence of the electoral system or not? Um, and uh, that kind of question, given our history, strikes me as you, you can't resolve it by citing King's speech in 1963 uh, or uh, Justice Thomas's opinion in the our Harvard Students for Fair Admission civil rights case. That, that's a question about historical judgment and historical responsibility that I think transcends the conventional colorblindness debate. I've talked for a long time. Am I making any sense to you? You are, and you're making me think about how maybe Coleman could have done another 50 pages, but and it puts him in hotter water, but because Coleman's response to a lot of that, not all of it, not the voting part, but a lot of it is that the differences that are there are because of cultural differences. And you can put it that way, but what you really mean is something black people need to work on. And so you might argue that the overrepresentation of black people in prison is because of problems with us ourselves. I think Coleman would agree with that. I'm not saying that myself, but I think Coleman would agree with that. Or you know, the number of black students who are eligible for this, you know, elite program or that one, it's because of aspects of the black family or something like that. It's that we're not doing something that Jewish and Korean kids are, are doing. And so his answer to a lot of this, and he does talk in the book about how there are differences that clearly are not due to racism. And what he doesn't quite say is that the differences are cultural. There's something about black culture that means that we are apparently more represented in basketball, there is something about, apparently about Cambodian culture that means that more of them had donut shops in California, although I'm sure that that's just a matter of chance. But there's some things where cult cultures value some things more than others, or Jewish shopkeepers in Harlem in the early 20th century. And so his answer is that, as opposed to that we should look at it as Glenn Lowry was looking at, for example, prisons in 1999, where you think, well, something's wrong if this many people who are of color are in prison. And I fully understand what your analysis of it was. But for Coleman, colorblindness also makes sense, I think, because most of the discrepancies are based on things that we need to think about and get better at. Now, that's fighting words for a great many people. And maybe he didn't want to go there with this book. But is that a fair representation of what you get from his views? Yeah, I don't, I don't think you distorted it. Uh, and I have a lot of sympathy for those views. I, I, you know, nobody is coming to save us uh, from the and enemy within. you don't within. like Omar? Like they, these are, they, you know, Omar is a part of a manifestation of the enemy within, the rot within African-American culture and society, which inhibits us from being able to seize opportunity. We need to take responsibility for our lives, for our communities. We need to own up to our uh, what we owe our ancestors and what we owe our progeny, the black family, seven and 10 kids born to a woman without a husband, the glorification of violence, the uh, nihilism. Uh, and, you know, we've lost our way, uh, you know, kind of talk like that. Uh, but I would say uh, black culture, which is real, is not autonomous from the larger matrix of cultural, political, social, uh, and, and economic uh, development. Uh, I, I mean, I, you know, a drug market, there are buyers and sellers. Uh, the fact that the existence of uh, illicit commerce and substances might lead to uh, a certain kind of criminal organizations getting formed and the 
you know, certain patterns of behavior that are uh, counterproductive uh, being uh, observed in, in some quarter of society. But the larger culture is clearly implicated in the uh, phenomenon of uh, hedonistic pursuit of whatever people are turning on their television. They're looking at, you know, some of the kids who are buying are driving in from the suburbs and stuff. So if I just make that into a black space, I'm, 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 it's like I'm carving out the African-American component of society as if it were autonomous. And then I lecture them about being like that when, in fact, they're a part of the larger system. Even in the marriage and dating market, man, I mean, uh, so interrelations between black men and women have uh, some problematic aspects, which I think are manifested by family structure statistics of the sort that I was just citing, kids born out of wedlock and abortion rates and so forth and so on. This is the fruit of relationships that are developing such as they are developing, and they're relationships among Black men and women. But how Black men and women relate to each other can't be completely independent of how white men and Black women relate to each other, because there's a question of the bargaining that goes on inside relationships and the outside options of the people in those relationships, which depend upon the behavior, not just of Black people, but also of others. I don't know, maybe that example is kind of uh, archaic, but I'm, I'm just saying to then look at how black men and women relate and wag my finger at them. Look at how you are and not realize that they would be relating very differently if black men, women and white men were relating differently. The intra-racial uh, gender dynamic not being independent of the interracial gender dynamic uh, makes it more difficult to just talk about as it, if it were an independent thing, uh, Black culture. So it's so hard, though, because there are also just vagaries. Like Black teen pregnancy, way, way, way down. If we're going to talk about babies having babies, we're going to sound a little 1991 at this point. Nobody knows exactly why. What you just described about the problems between Black men and Black women, I'm familiar with that literature. Is that true now? Or are we talking about problems that were true maybe 20 years ago and before that are less now, including the woman with however many kids by however many men. That's not, things change. And it wasn't because of any one thing. These things change. And, and as we both know, the black family was much stronger when racism was absolutely overt. Segregation was overt. And circumstances were much different. And so social history is so complicated that Sometimes I think it can be hard to say we need to address the racial imbalance because we're not really always as sure as we'd like to be as to why it's there. Um, I'm trying to stick up for Coleman here, although I completely understand what you're what you're saying. Um, this this stuff is it, it's hard. I would venture to say that if and Coleman is not saying that we don't perceive color, but if he's really saying knock off the race stuff utterly and completely. It's a little simplistic, and Coleman is not simplistic. But I think he wants to make a clean message. Um, and yet, this is what people said to me, and I'm going to say this about him, although it's not something I'm afraid of. He's going to be misinterpreted. A lot of people are going to think that what he's saying is knock off this race stuff completely. Racism doesn't matter. It's utterly insignificant. And everything that we've been hearing about race over the past 40 years has been a mistake. There are going to be people who are very thankful to him for supposedly saying that. I hope he can be clear as he can that he thinks he thinks much more. He, he, his thoughts are much more complex and much more nuanced than that. You're always going to be misinterpreted, though. That's the way it goes. Anybody who so, knows anything interesting is in the in the Bill Maher interview. Um, it's, oh, Glenn, it's very quickly, kind of folks. I should say I don't watch talk shows, including ones that I have appeared on. So I didn't see this, but Glenn can testify to it. <laughs> we needed to hear that, did we? Well, just okay. I, oh, you I, just I, wanted them to know you hadn't seen it. I didn't you see don't it. see it. It's a matter of principle. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I, only, I just I only tuned in, except for once. Oh, he doesn't even watch the one he's on, man. I have on my DVR right now the Bill Maher thing that I was in. <laughs> I don't go back and watch it, but I'm, I'm saving that thing so that my grandkids can see it. I always am uh, I'm reading and listening to music, and so I just don't choose to look at those shows. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah, well, okay. I'm slumming down there with Bill Maher and Coleman Hughes <laughs> in the pop culture uh, ghetto sewer. But um, they, they were slapping each other's back about... Uh, 
about two things. One of them is that we made a lot of progress and people say we haven't made any progress. Or, and the other is, come on, you're overplaying your hand here. You know, black kids got to go to one corner of the room and white kids to the other corner of the room and all that kind of crazy stuff. Which is, which is so revolting. The, the yeah. wokesters are overplaying their hand. Right. Um, they, you know, they, they don't deal, you know, with, with, the, with the deepest questions, but then you wouldn't expect that on a talk show. That's why you don't watch. And, you know, I'm not trying to sound elitist. When somebody sits me in front of one of those shows, I thoroughly enjoy them. And I watch <laughs> a lot of other TV. I've just never been a talk show person. I have never seen an episode of Jimmy Fallon. I never watched Letterman because I'm always doing oh, something else. I don't watch else those guys either. I don't watch the, those guys that, either. That time. And Marr is, you know, a very different order than Jimmy Fallon. But it's just my habit is not to watch shows where people are sitting in in evening in, in blazers having okay, conversations. So I want to know what you think about this. This is me reporting from the Bill Maher show that was broadcast on Friday, February tenth, twenty twenty four, on HBO. Uh, this was what I took away from not the Coleman part, but the other part of the show. Biden should step down. Mm. They went on, Biden is, is the Ruth Bader Ginsburg of our time. Ginsburg stayed too long at the Supreme Court. She was in poor health. If she had retired early, she would have allowed Barack Obama to appoint her successor. She did not. She lingered and unfortunately passed away. And so Donald J. Trump got to name her successor. The rest is history. Uh, and Biden is staying too long. Uh, last week, there were a spate of stories. I'm not going to recite them about Biden's, you know, faux pas. Uh, oh, including a Justice Department uh, decision not to pursue indictment against him on the documents retention scandal because they couldn't imagine, says the Justice Department, as it explains its decision not to indict, a jury convicting this person of willful uh, a violation when, in fact, his memory and his uh, cognitive functioning, these are my words, but this was to the effect, uh, is such that a jury wouldn't, could, could easily be persuaded by the defense to, to acquit, and therefore we're not going to bring the case. Uh, so Biden is taking a lot of hits, and this became the subject of Mars' uh, interchange with his guests on the panel, um, Caitlin Flanagan of The Atlantic, and uh, Bob Costas, the fabled sports reporter. That's a great trio up there. Uh, and and they were they were basically saying, oh, you it was know, just those two. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah, those yeah. It was the it was Mar with yeah. Caitlin Flanagan. Coleman was the uh, intro segment that he right. does a one on one with. Yeah, before the panel, uh, they were saying Biden should step down. They were saying he's clearly incompetentus, uh, and, and they want an intervention. They, they want the party at the convention to, uh, you know, have an open convention challenge. And, you know, if he if he doesn't have the good sense to voluntarily step down, then uh, remove him as the party standard bearer because they are fearful that his uh, status uh, will be so enfeebled as to uh, cost him the election. Because it doesn't look like the Supreme Court is going to, this is based on oral argument in the case uh, that where Trump is challenging the disqualification move based on the insurrection and 14th Amendment considerations, taking Trump's name off the ballot as has been attempted in several jurisdictions. And that argument is getting to the court. And that uh, trio that I just got through describing at the Bill Maher show, don't think that uh, the um, outcome of that procedure is going to be what they want. In other words, the Supreme Court is probably going to uphold Trump's objection to being removed from the ballot for uh, 14th Amendment reasons. I, I'm not asking you or us to parse that. I'm just reporting that's what they think. And because that way out doesn't seem to be available, and besides, I would say it shouldn't be taken even if it were available. We had that discussion before. You have to defeat this guy. You can't get him out of Contention on a technicality that's laying the seed for trouble for uh, for the foreseeable future. That's a bad move. But in any case, talking about all of that. So I don't know. What do you think about what do you think about? That? I like the argument. I thought Ross Douthat did a particularly good job on it in a recent Times editorial. I don't think that 
um, Biden has what dementia, but he's slowed. He has slowed down even over the past four years. And it's to the point where his general appearance is so underpowered in a market where charisma is necessary to win an election. He just doesn't have it anymore. It's not his fault. And Trump is making mistakes as well, but he, he, he does it with a certain star power. He's a performer rather than a talker, which makes him seem more vigorous. Also that he dyes his hair and you know, he's got that silly fake tan, et cetera. He looks more vigorous. And so he's going to sway more people who are on the fence. Nobody could possibly be excited about Biden and Harris this time. And yeah, he's not going to step down. In a way, he can't. Um, there's the whole Harris issue, which is especially awkward. But yeah, someone needs to, to remove him. <laughs> and there needs to be a Democratic secret weapon. It would be interesting to see who that was going to be. I don't see it being Michelle Obama, but somebody who via charisma and quickness on their feet could at least give Trump a run for his money. It is scary watching Biden at this point because that person probably can't win the election. And it would be one thing if the Republican in question were John McCain or Mitt Romney, but it's this gorilla. And so, yeah, something something needs to be done. Well, how do you get around the Harris problem no matter what happens? He can step down and she's the uh, default person because she's the vice president. That's why, uh, or he could be replaced, and then she's available to be the default person. Available, uh, right? But it needs to be such that she's not chosen, which is why it needs to get down to the. And and the, why is it is why is that? I, if Donna Brazil were here, she would object. I've seen her on these shows that you don't watch. Uh, she comes on the uh, ABC version of these shows that you don't watch, and I actually <laughs> like her. I I, I DVR uh, the, the George Stephanopoulos this week. A program just so that I can watch the 10 minutes of my girl Donna Brazil on the panel. I've always enjoyed uh, her. She she's a, you know, she she's a formidable. Glenn, I've got to put something in here. You're gonna get me in trouble. Yeah. I don't look down on these talk shows. It's just that <laughs> there's only 24 minutes, 24 hours in the day. Okay. And it's okay. never been a habit. I love the Mars show, but people sit me in front of it and I thoroughly enjoy it. And then I don't watch the next one because I've always got a book on my lap. That's every all. every time she gets a chance, Donna Brazil comes to Kamala Harris's defense, saying that she's greatest thing since sliced bread, and how dare you talk about she not being fit to be president? So why do you feel that she's a problem? Um, I think that accounts of her incompetence seem exaggerated because I never see them really backed up. Exactly what is she doing so wrong? Sometimes she's a little inarticulate, but you know, aren't aren't most of us? My issue with her is that she wouldn't have the charisma to beat Donald Trump. In a different moment, she'd be a very interesting thing. Now, I have to say this. Uh, we're getting toward the end of the hour, but I uh, tuned in or logged on to uh, Tucker Carlson's interview of Vladimir Putin, which is an outrageous thing in many people's minds that Tucker Carlson, uh, the right-wing attack dog, former Fox News uh, uh, anchor, uh, guy who's now at, uh, what does he call it? Tucker Carlson something. I mean, he's got his own website and he's, you know, making a gazillion dollars and he, you know, he's continuing to produce his commentary. He's going to go and interview Vladimir Putin. And secondly, that Vladimir Putin is going to give an interview to the American press, Vladimir Putin, the uh, evil incarnate. What could we possibly have to learn from? So I, I watched 30 minutes of a two hour interview. And it was propagandistic, Putin going on, giving his spiel about uh, why it is that uh, Russia rightly feels threatened by NATO expansion and how Ukraine is a kind of made-up country. And I, I paraphrase, but this was whatever you would expect him to say. It's propaganda. And Carlson, trying to be a serious journalist, occasionally treating Putin as if he were an American political candidate for some office by asking him the trick question. Putin artfully, you know, Laying off of them, he, he he has his you know he has his propagandistic mission that he's that he's hewing to. Carlson's inappropriate laughter asserts itself from uh, time to time when you know he gets that high pitched kind of giggle uh, that sounds so adolescent. And I thought, oh God, Tucker, not a good look. Uh, but uh, 
uh, all I could think was Joe Biden could never pull this off. <laughs> he, um, Putin gave an extended disquisition. It was historical and philosophical in its evil way, okay? It, it, in its Putin-esque way. It's his, it, but it, it was a serious disquisition. You know, uh, and when Tucker tried to deflect him, he, he, you know, and he wasn't reading a cue card, man. I mean, he was, this was a mind. Evil mind, bad mind, bad, bad Putin, bad Putin. Don't get me wrong, but still, I looked at that and I said, the leader of my country could never explain himself this effectively. Do we care? <laughs> yeah. Because it's the vision thing, so to speak, that the first George Bush said that he didn't have. Part of this is um, it's about linguistic culture. Macron could do that. Um, yeah. Angela Merkel could do that. Not all the equivalents. Berlusconi could not have done that. But there's room in European culture for leaders who can give that old school kind of disquisition. And Putin is one of those people. Doesn't happen here much. I think the last president we've had who would have pulled that off, and frankly, it's not Obama. Obama could write it and deliver it, like he has it in his head, but he couldn't do it off the cuff. That's not how he talks. Clinton could have done that. That was the kind of mind he happened to have. But it's not as encouraged as much in, um, in, in America. But no, you're right. That's a, that's a very important comparison. Whereas Trump could, for, over the same amount of time, say a whole lot of bullshit, but in a very charismatic way, which is a way of orating, Whereas Biden wouldn't even have the energy to keep going, not to mention wouldn't have had those things to say. That's not somebody who we need, especially now. It's a problem. Yeah, Putin is, is vital, whereas Biden is just kind of waiting for it to be over. That's, it's scary to see. Four years is an awfully long time. I mean, if people are saying this about Biden now in anticipation of an election, to an office which he would be obliged to serve for another four years, given 86. the decline, I think, that we might be have been witness to over the past four years in Biden's uh, vitality. 86. God, what are we asking of the country? And, and uh, this really interests me because the discourse is not honest about this. Um, yeah. 86. All right. And so we would be yeah. basically signing up for Kamala to be a caretaker, for her to be president for at least the final two years of it. Why are we signing up for that as opposed to somebody who could do it themselves for the next four years? It's, it, it's a very wobbly proposition. All uh, right. Well, to be continued. That was depressing. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. All right, John, let's call it a day. Okay, come on. Talk to you very soon. 